Here we are again. So our next session is named Blue Noise Sampling of Data on Photographs. Uh, with surge in the volumes of dimensions of data that is processed and analyzed and not included in domains. A fundamental problem in this network is to determine which nodes play the most important role. Graph signal sampling and recovery thus become essential. In this talk, Gonzalo and Daniel will present a family of methods developed under the umbrella of blue noise sam sampling on graphs and multigraph recently introduced uh, that are based on simple principles and have low computational cost. A fascinating aspect of this work is that it draws from various disciplines within signal processing, spectral graph theory, and from digital optimizing, which uh, is the process of converting a continuous tone digital image into a pattern of printed and not printed dots for reproduction by inkjet or laser printers. They will highlight the rich interaction among these fields of study to explain the principles of the blue noise sampling. So Gonzalo, Arc, and Daniel. Hello, welcome to our talk, Blue Noise Sampling on Multigraphs. My name is Gonzalo Arce, I'm with the University of Delaware. The talk is also given by Professor Daniel Lau from the University of Kentucky. Graphs represent a set of nodes and these nodes are connected among themselves by a set of edges. And the edges represent the connectivity between these nodes. And in our interest, in our talk, we would like to represent attributes or signals or data that live in those nodes. For example, in this traffic network shown on the top left, we have nodes that represent locations in a city and the edges represent the connectivity between these locations. And the data that lives on this, on this network could be congestion, could be speed, could be waiting time, could be a number of attributes that represent data on these nodes. In social networks, the nodes may be individuals and these individuals are connected to friends or some sort of social network structure. And the attributes may be interest in common, maybe the, the, the songs or the music that they like there of interest to a, a sub a sub network. It could be financial data, it can be many different attributes that live on these nodes of the social network. And like that, there are many examples of data that lives on graphs, like in computer graphics or imaging, where pixels uh, have a relationship with, with neighborhoods and so on. These networks can represent complex systems in this example, for example, the nodes are research papers and the edges between these nodes are citation between the paper. You can see some papers are related to others and the nodes have some attributes or signals. In this example, the signals may are, for instance, the number of citations that are represented by the diameter of the node. The bigger the diameter, the more cited this paper is. And the color of the node represents the, paper, the topic of the paper. So as you can see, these graphs are very powerful in representing uh, information on irregular grids. The problem that we are interested in addressing is sampling of these attributes and nodes. These networks are, can be very, very big. For instance, in a social network, you may have millions of individuals and these millions of individuals may carry information that is uh, uh, of interest and processing all of this information for all of those nodes can be computationally very expensive. So sampling is the process by which we can sample a subset of nodes, maybe 10% or 5% of these nodes and measure the attributes or the signals or the data that's in each of those sample nodes. Yet, if we're interested in knowing or reconstructing the attributes 
of uh, the, the, the signals of interest in all of the nodes, then we will be able to reconstruct it from the set of sample nodes. Right, so we're representing the data, we're representing the signals of interest with fewer observations in, in the networks. And the talk today uh, will tell you how we can do this sampling very efficiently at low computational com complexity. Now, before I get into the details of blue noise sampling, let me first present some basic notation that I can use throughout this talk. First, let's agree that on the left, I show a random sensor network composed of nodes which contain a scalar value. These scalar values are represented by the variable x with a subscript i representing that this is the scalar value found in the ith node. Now also notice that two neighboring nodes, i and j, have a link or edge connecting them, and that this edge has a weight described by a 2D subscript, indicating that this is the weight between the ith and j nodes. Since we have n different nodes, we have n times n different edges. However, we're defining our edges as being bidirectional such that the edge from node i to node j is the same as node j to node i. Also, there are no self-connected nodes, so the weight connecting the ith node to itself is equal to zero. We call this graph an undirected graph and the matrix of all edges as an n by n symmetric weight matrix. Having our weight matrix, we define our diagonal degree matrix such that the ith diagonal within D is equal to the sum of all the weights connected to the ith node. We then define our graph Laplacian by subtracting our weight matrix from our diagonal matrix and then applying eigen or decomp eigenvalue decomposition, we can extract a matrix of eigenvectors. We can then take our original signal, which is now listed as a length n signal vector, and multiply it by this matrix of eigenvectors to derive our coefficients for the graph Fourier transform. Showing our random sensor network from before, I've defined my signal vector as n uncorrelated Gaussian random values. And any time you multiply a vector of uncorrelated random values by a set of orthonormal basis vectors, you likewise expect to get a set of uncorrelated random values. And since our eigenvectors are normal, we expect the variance of the Fourier coefficients to equal the variance of our vertex domain signal values. We do not, for instance, expect any of our Fourier coefficients to equal zero and that's true for all graph frequencies. Now, that is unlike what we now call, or what I'll now introduce is the concept of a band-limited graph signal. And so what I mean by a band-limited graph signal is that only the lowest set of coefficients is not zero, and that there is a point along the frequencies at which all frequency, or all frequency coefficients above that bandwidth are equal to zero. And so what I'm illustrating here is I have the same coefficients in the first 30 elements from here as before, except I've replaced the highest coefficients with zero. I then did an inverse graph Fourier transform and I got the signal that you see on the left. And what you should see looking at this new signal is that the colors uh, evolve from one node to the next very slowly. And so this is an example of a smooth signal. And so when we use this word band limited, we could equally use the word smooth. A question of how smooth is the signal on the graph corresponds to how low the bandwidth is of that signal. Now, supposing we have a band limited signal and that the bandwidth of the signal is k non-zero GFT coefficients. Then we know for a fact that this n-length signal can be downsampled to k preserved values because the inverse GFT is in fact a set of n equations with k values that produce n original samples. But of course, we're not sampling the signal in the Fourier space, but the vertex domain. So the problem of graph signal sampling is finding those k nodes 
such that we can reconstruct not just one particular signal on the graph, but any graph signal on that graph. And again, real signals are not band limited. They have some minimal amount of energy at the highest frequencies. Now, if you search the literature on graph sampling, you will find a wealth of sampling techniques that attempt to find the best K nodes out of N based upon an estimate of at least the first eigenvalue of the graph Fourier transform. The problem with these techniques is they may become prohibitively expensive, especially for large graphs. As such, our interest is in random sampling techniques that exist entirely in the vertex domain. So when we say random sampling, what we mean is choose the nodes in the vertex domain based upon some statistical internode relationship between the preserved nodes. And with that in mind, what I show here on the left is a completely random set of nodes that we call a white noise sampling pattern. And what I'm referring to here are the blue nodes, are the preserved samples, while the yellow nodes are the discarded samples. On the right is what we call a blue noise sampling process. And this is what I'm most interested in discussing here today. Now, the term blue noise was first introduced to describe visually pleasing halftone patterns created by air diffusion. And in a blue noise halftone pattern, the printed dots are distributed in a random uh, homogeneous distribution such that all the printed dots are approximately equally spaced from their neighbors. And they refer to this spacing between nearest neighbors as the principal wavelength of blue noise. And it was always represented by lambda with a sub B. Now, the reason why it's called blue noise as opposed to white noise or red noise or pink noise is if you look at the power spectrum of the 2D pattern, you will see a ring of energy such that uh, there'll be a peak along the ring and that frequency is actually the inverse of the wavelength. You'll then have a flat response above the principal wavelength, and there is your blue energy. All of the energies inside the principal frequency, which is again the inverse of the wavelength, would be close to zero. And so since white light is composed of all light of the rainbow, red light is the low frequency terms, blue light is the high frequency terms, it's referred to as blue noise. In order to characterize the intersample relationship of a given sampling technique, we propose the use of the pair correlation. Like the spatial domain, the pair correlation for graphs is the ratio of the preserved or sampled nodes that exist inside an annular ring centered around a given sampled node, divided by the number of nodes in the ring multiplied by the sampling density. Values of the pair correlation greater than one indicate an increased likelihood of a sample node occurring at a given distance from the sample node at the center of the ring, whereas values of the pair correlation less than one indicate an inhibition of nodes at a given distance from our sample node. As shown on the left, since nodes are placed in a completely uncorrelated fashion, white noise has a flat pair correlation equal to one for all internode distances. Blue noise, on the other hand, spreads the nodes apart to an approximately equal spacing, the principal wavelength. As such, we see a peak in the pair correlation at this distance with an inhibition of points at distances less than the blue noise principal wavelength. Now, in the Fourier space, we see that white noise, as given by its name, has a flat spectral response for all eigenvalues. Blue noise, on the other hand, through the inhibition of clustering, is able to minimize the existence or the occurrence of low frequency spectral content, resulting in a high frequency only spectral profile, which is where blue noise earns its name. So to characterize the ideal spatial and spectral profile of blue noise, we see that the pair correlation has a value close to zero for wavelengths less than the principal wavelength. 
It has a peak at the principal wavelength, and then it converges to one as the correlation between the sampled nodes is becomes uncorrelated as they get further apart. In the power spectrum, blue noise has no low frequency uh, energy, but is dominated by high frequency energy. Now, to understand why blue noise is good for sampling, let's consider the problem of stochastic sampling grids. What we see on the left is the spectral profile of a blue noise sampling grid, where in the center of the power spectrum, you see the DC value or the baseband. Shown in the center is a circular band limited signal whose highest frequency is less than one half the inverse of the principal frequency. Uh, wavelength. Now, if we were to sample this signal in the center by our blue noise pattern on the left, this would result in convolving the two signals in the spectral domain. And so what we see is there's that impulse at the DC value, and that is the baseband that preserves the baseband signal, whereas all the high frequency content uh, of the blue noise pattern results in aliasing. And again, as long as we sample it at the Nyquist rate or above, we're able to preserve a circular band limited signal better than any periodic sampling grid, such as a rectangular grid or a hexagonal grid. So why is blue noise good for graph sampling? To answer that, we need to define this metric called redness, this RS metric. And Redness is just a linear combination of the spectra of the graph sampling pattern. And the linear combination uh, has weights that are inversely proportional to the frequency, so low frequency components are not inhibited in this metric. Uh, and if you do this linear combination, if the graph sampling pattern has low frequency, this term, this metric will be high. And if he has low frequency component, this, this metric will be low. And it has been shown that to have good sampling patterns uh, in graphs, you have to uh, maximize this constant. So we need to maximize this uh, term on the right hand side. And if we minimize the redness, it turns out that um, we're also affecting these uh, terms here of, of, of the volumetric G. So when you uh, carry out all the mathematics, you can show that this bound uh, is um, maximized, right? So it's maximizing this lower, lower limit. So by minimizing this metric redness, we're creating very good sampling patterns. So what we have seen is that Blue noise graph sampling provides very good sampling patterns. They're not the best, but they're very good. The best are obtained with complicated, computationally expensive algorithms. The beauty of graph, uh, blue noise graph sampling is its simplicity. Now, in order to generate blue noise patterns on graphs for testing and verification, we have employed a sampling technique based on a popular half-toning technique called void and cluster. In this algorithm, we measure the density of sampled nodes on the graph, iteratively moving the sample node in the tightest cluster to the loosest void, stopping when the two nodes repeatedly swap. Applying VAC to the random sensor network with varying sampling rates, we see in all cases the distinct pair correlation and power spectra that we modeled previously as being associated with ideal blue noise. To show experimental results showing how well blue noise compares to other Fourier-based sampling techniques, we performed a series of experiments on the random sensor network with a thousand nodes, with the top plot showing the mean squared error in the reconstructed signal when the signal had a bandwidth of 50 and was corrupted with additive white Gaussian noise at a signal to noise ratio of 20 decibels. The bottom plot is for a noiseless signal whose spectral energy rolled off starting at a bandwidth of 50. In both cases, VAC outperformed the state-of-the-art methods. 
However, let me emphasize that this experiment involved a homogeneous graph and signals that are not true band limited signals. Now, a problem with our VAC algorithm is that it doesn't recognize variations in node density across the graph. So regardless of how dense or sparse the nodes of the graph may be at a particular location, VAC always produces a smooth, non-varying sample node density. For this reason, VAC performs poorly in graphs that are not homogeneous themselves, as in our previous results. To address this issue, we propose an improved VAC that regularizes the graphs by multiplying each weight by the maximum degree corresponding to its two endpoints, raising this degree by the exponent alpha. What this does is it spreads apart nodes in high density regions while pulling together nodes in low densities. We then just apply VAC to the regularized graph. Here on the left is the result of applying VAC to the regularized butterfly graph, where alpha is set equal to 1.5. If we then unregularize the graph back to its original state, we see that VAC produces a density of nodes that is, corresponds directly to the density of the original graph. So we have a dense packing of sample nodes in dense regions of the graph, and we have sparse distribution of nodes in sparse areas of the graph. To see how well this works on a non-homogeneous graph like the Minnesota graph, we repeated our previous experiment of sampling a band-limited signal with additive white Gaussian noise with a signal-to-noise ratio of 20 decibels with ad adaptive VAC producing results second only to the ANIS method, which as we stated before, requires estimating the first eigenvector of the GFT. So what is a multigraph? As you can see, we have a set of nodes and these nodes are connected by these edges in the top left by these red edges uh, that have some sort of connectivity between these nodes. But right below it, you have the same set of nodes that are connected in a different way by these blue edges. So if you aggregate them, you're going to get the structure on the right where you get the set of nodes. But these nodes are connected with different uh, layers, if you will, or different classes of edges where the nodes may have connections that are blue and they may have different connections that are red. That, have different uh, meaning of connectivity. As an example, for instance, you could have a traffic network where the blue edges represent a blue uh, metro line and the red mean represent a different metro line. As you can see in the parish transport network, for instance, you can see how these metro locations are connected with various metro lines and you have different colors representing the connectivity between these nodes and different metro lines. In the community network in the middle, you have a similar concept where individuals may have connections to a set of friends and these friends could be social friends Right? There will be one set of edges, or it could be the blue lines in this community network would be the work uh, relationship between these, these individuals. So you can have very different types of edges between the nodes, depending on the type of activities that individuals have in community networks. So as you can see, multigraphs are very efficient in representing information and connectivity in complex networks and complex systems. To generate real data, we used an Intel RealSense RGB plus depth camera, along with a separate UV camera, and through a complicated calibration process, fused the RGB, near IR, and UV images onto a single 3D point cloud. 
the resulting point cloud was then composed of 9,812 points, where each point had not only its world X, Y, and Z coordinates, but also a scalar red, green, blue, near IR, and UV pixel value. We also added luminance derived from the RGB values to create what we called side information. In order to create a graph from this point cloud, we connected each node to its k nearest neighbors, where the weight connecting the neighbors was equal to the Euclidean distance between those neighbors. And that Euclidean distance created our first graph. For the second graph, we again connected each point or node with its k nearest neighbors using the difference in luminance as the weight of the edge. This was the second graph layer. So how do we sample a multigraph? The traditional method is to add the weights, or as shown here, take a weighted average of the weights across all the layers to create a single weight matrix and treat this as a traditional undirected graph. Now, this is what the state-of-the-art sampling algorithms propose, and they propose it for a reason, and that is that there is no agreed-upon Fourier transform for multigraphs. And this is a really big deal, and it's why we are interested in blue noise sampling. What we propose is an alternative to smashing together the component graphs, but to measure node density in our VAC algorithm first and then average together the densities later. Ultimately, blue noise sampling means minimizing clustering in the vertex domain. You don't need a Fourier domain to understand this. And so you can propose blue noise-like sampling algorithms for novel graph structures like multigraphs and multilayer graphs easily. And you can't easily port state-of-the-art algorithms that need a graph Fourier transform to perform. In this experiment, we reduced our point cloud to just over 4,000 nodes because of the time and memory demands of the sampling algorithms. I apologize for the difficulty in seeing the sampled nodes. However, you can clearly see where nodes are concentrated as indicated in blue. Whereas random white noise sampling and adaptive VAC applied to the merge graph, produces an approximately equally distributed pattern of nodes. Anis, Pui, and Tremblay have a noticeable concentration at the bottom of the point cloud, near the edges of the box onto which the bear is sitting. At the same time, so does our multigraph VAC, marked by the red dot above, while the blue dot marks adaptive VAC on the merged graph. For a quantitative measure of signal reconstruction quality, this graph shows the MSE for our reconstructed RGB, near IR, and UV signals versus the number of sampled nodes. From inspection, you can see that our multigraph VAC performs on par with ANIS and PUI, while not quite as good as Tremblay. It greatly outperforms VAC applied to the merged graph. Looking at specific channels of green and UV, we can see why it was so important to concentrate samples at the edge of the square box, as the air is especially strong in these areas for white noise sampling and adaptive VAC on the single graph. So in summary, graph blue noise sampling provides a simple and efficient way of capturing the information that lives on the nodes of very large graphs or very large networks by only looking at the information that lives on a small subset of nodes. And it is done such that if we're interested in reconstructing or looking at the information on all of the nodes by just knowing the information on just the, the subset of the sample nodes, this can be done efficiently with very little distortion. We have also shown how blue noise sampling can be applied to multigraphs, where multigraphs are 
node structures that include different types of connectivity between the nodes, like in the traffic networks, where nodes may be connected with different metro lines. And the concepts of blue noise can be equally uh, generalized to such uh, direct uh, such uh, connectivity. Finally, in closing, we are extending the concept of blue noise sampling to more complex graph structures, such as multi-layer and directed graphs, where the graphs may have directivity, the edges are not uh, going in two directions, but is giving a directed connectivity. Um, in this um, advantages, the advantages that we have in general of, of, of blue noise sampling is that we will get simple, effective sampling mechanisms that do not require spectral decompositions and can be done more efficiently just knowing the information in the vertex domain. Uh, as, as well, we are looking at applications in imaging and financial networks and so on. Thank you very much for your attention.